Our uh, focus today is ministry. And we have entitled this word, The Disposition of the Heart. And I also want to thank the Lord for the many years he has held our hands since Celebrate Recovery has uh, come to, uh, has joined our health ministries here. Uh, this year, I think it's in November, uh, we hope to uh, celebrate our 10th anniversary. Amen. I'm thanking the Lord for nine and a half. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. And with all that we've gone through, with all the, the victories, all the uh, challenges, all the disruptions this pandemic has put against us, it has not diminished our passion for what we do here, not in the least bit. We have uh, put out some, uh, some announcements asking the church to, um, asking our church members to uh, follow those who are interested to volunteer uh, for our leadership team. So I'm here today to say that there's still some openings men and women, and we're, uh, we surmise this should be about, uh, ideally it should be maybe uh, at least six or more volunteers to, uh, that will help us jumpstart and to make an impact on this church and in this community. So, the disposition of the heart. Today, today I am prepared to overstate the obvious. The gospel of Jesus Christ, it brings hope, it brings light, it brings a safe refuge. And it is the power of God unto salvation. Under the umbrella of ministry, there, is, there are Christian recovery programs that take seriously the fall of man. Even the contradictions of public life, church life, and those hidden cultivated sins. Therefore, judge nothing before its time until the Lord comes when he will bring to light those hidden darknesses and the and will bring and these uh, and he will bring to light those things that uh, uh, the counsel of the heart. The Bible says the counsel of the heart. the hidden things of darkness, and will make known the counsel of the heart. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, open up, open up our hearts where our compassion and empathy are subject to your holy influence. We ask, O oh Lord, that as we listen, may the ministries of this church be wholly inclusive to the needs of this community. May your name be magnified and glorified in this word. For Christ's name we do pray. One of the privileges of personal ministries is the ongoing dialogue with God's spirit. It is in consequence of connecting our ministry to our prayer life. Periodically, God awakens his people in the middle of the night. Our minds wrestling with whatever we're having to deal with as the Lord gives us warning and gives us wisdom and gives us understanding. For me, one particular night, I was lying there uh, trying to connect the dots. There was some word or scripture or some understanding I had yet to 
uh, fully appreciate it. And so uh, I was doing the best I can uh, in the comfort of my bed, but to no avail. So I got up and I headed towards my uh, study. So I turned on the lamp and I'm sitting there and I'm looking around at um, uh, books and notepads and pictures and my laptop, I'm looking at my Bible open. And I was sure that whatever I was looking for was on this desk or somewhere in the pages of these books. And so uh, there was books everywhere, and it was, it was a, it's an organized mess of what it is on my desk. And so finally, I began to focus in. I noticed that it's about a little after four in the morning. And uh, I began to focus in on these books sitting behind my laptop. And uh, one of them uh, caught my attention. And so I pulled it out because it's, uh, it's, a, yo it's a yellowish uh, uh, paperback book. And there's, it, it, it's a, it, there's a picture depicting um, a, a sunrise over a lake. And uh, there are, there's this family that are striding along the lake with an early morning jog. Who knows what I'm talking about? Somebody guessed it. The Ministry of Healing, Health and Happiness. And so I'm looking at it, and when you open it up, when you look at the first page, when you look at the first page, uh, the author of the book, she says, and I quote, our example, our Lord Jesus Christ came, our Lord Jesus Christ came to this world as the unwearied servant of man's necessity. He took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses that he might minister to every need of humanity. She's quoting from Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. Interesting enough, I, I, I don't look at, I rarely ever look at this book anymore. I have a health a ministry of, uh, uh, health and ministries, I have that in my digital library. So I haven't looked at it in a long time. But as I, but as I was looking at it, uh, there was a, um, there was a torn and tattered uh, bookmarker and the torn and tattered bookmarker, uh, it, it was between the pages of 64 and 65. And so as I was looking at it, uh, there was uh, hands clasping on that page. And so I, I, I'm focusing in on this here, and I know that I've read this page, I've read this chapter before, chapter 11. And so I begin to ponder uh, a beyond the obvious, and it came to me. Accountability. But of course, accountability. God's people need to take a closer look at accountability to God and to one another. One of the vehicles one of the vehicles for this, one of the ministries to drive that principle, accountability, is where recovery is revealed and healing is realized. Ministry is our focus today. And beloved, stay with me. It's, it's a strong and it's a, it's a solemn message, but it's a necessary message. It's not only for us, but it's for those who are watching and listening also. And so it's, the book says, she says, our example, our spirit, his spirit, the Lord's ministry, and the Lord's prophet is the tenor of our presentation today. The servant of the Lord, she writes in that. She says, Every true reform has its place in the work of the gospel, and it tends to the uplifting of the soul to the new and nobler life. Especially does temperance reform, 
demand the support of Christian workers. They should call attention to this work and make it a living issue. Everywhere they should present to the people of God the principles of true temperance and call for signers of the temperance pledge. Earnest efforts should be made in behalf of those who are in bondage to evil habits. She goes on to say, there is everywhere a work to be done for those who through intemperance have fallen. In the midst of churches, religious institutions, and professionally Christian homes, many, including our youth, are choosing the path to destruction. Through intemperate habits, they bring upon themselves disease, and through greed to obtain money for sinful indulgence, they fall into dishonest practices. Health and character are ruined, aliens from God, outcasts from society. These poor souls feel that they are without hope either in this life or the life to come. The hearts are broken. The, the hearts of the families are broken. Men speak of these erring ones as hopeless. But not so does God regard them. He understands the circumstances that they have made, that has made them what they have become. And he looks upon them with pity. This is the class that demands help. She says, never give them occasion to say, no man cares for my soul. So, beloved, this is what God, I believe this is what God has, has wanted me to bring to you to the fore as to make this clarion call for our 10th anniversary for Celebrate Recovery. It is his spirit, his ministry, his prophet is the tenor of this presentation. And I am convinced that that torn and tethered a uh, bookmarker is about eight to 10 years old. Celebrate Recovery is a ministry based on biblical principles. It's a 12-step program, and it's, uh, it is guided by its biblical comparisons. Our goal is to let go and let God take our lives, and, and, and uh, as we follow him, uh, he is using his strength, his power, to heal us, enabling us and breaking the chains that bind us. And in progression, this allows us to be changed spiritually, emotionally, and relationally. Think about it. It is in a safe environment where there is no judgment, we get to work on our recovery. So whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're struggling with, faith is the victory of the soul which can purify our hearts. So it is by faith we begin to accept God's uh, grace and his forgiveness in solving life's problems. We begin to, uh, uh, we begin, as a group, we begin to uh, open up the door to those debilitating uh, uh, secrets by sharing our, uh, our experiences, our, uh, uh, our hopes with one another. And, and those, all those who come to Celebrate Recovery meetings, they come to understand, they come to realize that it is, uh, we are as sick as our secrets. Those debilitating secrets that linger there in the darkness, 
they grow and they become more harmful. So we continue to take inventory and when we are wrong, we properly admit it. These, uh, uh, these, these come in uh, degrees. We grow in degrees. Many of our recovery comes in degrees, a maturing process from strength to strength, but we are reminded to never think our standing is, is in our own strength. We must take heed the disposition of the heart and that our standing is by faith, working out our salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who works in us both to will and to act according to his purpose. What is the disposition of the heart? Let's unpack this for a moment. It is the dominant quality, the character of a person, our dominant moods and attitudes towards the life around us, our environment, our learned or behavior genetics, our predicament, born in sin, shaping in iniquity, our susceptibilities, forming habits consciously or unconsciously that could become contributors of addictive habits or mental health or both. There is another theological component to the disposition of the heart taken from the eight principles of Matthew's chapter five, the Beatitudes. Each Beatitude depicts the ideal heart condition of a citizen of God's kingdom. In this idyllic state, the believer, the believer experiences grace and abundant spiritual blessings. And Jesus is the source and power of such grace and blessings. For example, the first beatitude describes the spiritual condition of the heart, and Jesus says, happy are you for demonstrating your lowly and humble uh, spirit, for such is the kingdom of God. Why? Because being confident of this one thing, he who, who, he who began a good work in us will carry it on until completion, until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6 and 7. To the people of God, the disposition of the heart is huge. We are committed to the increments of Christian grace, knowing full well that growth is required. Our, this light is not helping me. Our, our uh, brothers and sisters in Celebrate Recovery come to know whatever we are struggling with, don't let it be our faith in God. Let it be your faith in God. We have, an anchor of, we have an anchor who keeps the soul steadfast and sure, and his name is Jesus. A Christ-centered recovery curriculum that is, un, that is uncompromisingly biblical, designed, for, designed especially for churches. No pastor, no senior pastor uh, support, no celebrate recovery. Taking moral and spiritual inventory is accountability. Openly examine and confess my faults to myself and to God and to someone I trust. It is, it is ethical to share certain things about yourself with someone you trust. Of the eight principles of the Beatitudes, that one is principle four. In these lessons, in these lessons, all 25 of them, both, biblical, both Bible Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, are rigorously uh, applied in our lesson studies with contextual integrity. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. David's Psalm 51, verse 12. 
Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 340. Our understanding of the law and grace, the flesh and the spirit are, for example, rooted in the synoptic Gospels and the writings of the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 7 is not a literary device for our consideration, as some have suggested. It is the truth. The, the, we are, the law is spiritual, and we are unspiritual. We are born with a sinful nature. Our conscience has become a witness against us in a world filled with every illicit enticement. the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's what I struggle with. That's what Reggie Bolden struggled with. In Romans chapter 7, verse 24, the apostle Paul is now in, he's in, he is in total exasperation. Oh, who, who, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God for Jesus Christ. Or somebody else might say, who is willing to deliver me from my eating disorder or from my bitterness, my self-mutilation, or my gambling addiction, or my domestic violence, my unforgiveness, or the trauma of divorce? or my video gaming addiction. You do know, you do know that loneliness, abandonment, and resentment can become a real struggle. You do know that, right? Abandonment, loneliness, and resentment. Every opportunity our state and local cele celebrate recovery um, uh, leadership, uh, our representatives are conferencing, are conferencing on and updating uh, each local CR of the issues of mental health and suicide prevention. We are not trained physicians, obviously, but we value basic awareness and referral information, including emergency assistance. I'm giving you a picture of what this, these, uh, what's going on in the room, in these CR uh, rooms, and these programs. Christian recovery programs are not for alcohol abuse. They're not for drug abuse or sexual sin exclusively. We have to do better than that for people's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. The disposition of the heart. Our hurts are primarily the result of disturbing situations stemming from relationship issues. Abuse, abandonment, divorce, codependency, and so on. Our hang-ups are negative attitudes we use to cope with adversity, anger, depression, fear, unforgiveness, and so on. Our habits have become the crux of our intemperance. Smoking. Drugs, alcohol, sexual sin, gambling. This is what our Savior has been ministering to since the fall of man. And there are many kinds of ministries. Our experience is that Christian ministry has the power of victory when the ministry is connected to our prayer life. I remember when I was baptized. Everybody remembers when they were baptized. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe it, was maybe it was maybe two, maybe three months. And the church came to me, and the church asked me, would I serve on the usher board? I remember, I, 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 think, the, I, I think the cabbage patch was in when that was going on. I, I, I remember, and I, I, had, I was trying to keep my cool. 
So I, I, I told my wife, hey, baby, they asked me to serve on, on the usher board. She says, yeah, they did? I said, yeah. I said, um, do you think they're going to do a background check on us? You know, because the devil's working with me. They're going to take this good thing that, you know, they're going to take it from me. Because I, because I just got pulled over for uh, not doing a full stop at the stop sign. And I know that the, the police, he saw the Bible sitting on the front seat of the car. So I'm tripping, you know. I want, I want to serve. And that's what Valley Crossroads is like. Ministry is the heart of this church. Ministry. And Christian ministry, Christian ministry is where our, our fervor, our, our, our sincerity, and our power comes from because we're carrying forth what Jesus had us to do. And he sent 70 men out there to go out, and when they came back, they was talking about the power of God in ministry. And you know, our Lord, he's cool. He's kicking back like, you know, don't, don't be tripping. Uh, uh, just be glad that your name is in the book of heaven, in the Lamb's book of life, you know, because uh, this is what you're going to do. You're going to do even greater things than this. And so we as a church, we can do greater things than that because the Lord said we could. Ministry, ministry, the Ministry of Healing was published in 1909. In the mid-1800s, America was on the verge of civil war. In 1853, they had just invented the hypodermic syringe. And the medical staff was injecting uh, our soldiers and our citizens with uh, morphine. And it is, it is very likely that you're be going to become addicted to morphine. And at that time, a whiskey was dirt cheap. This is, this, is, this is chapter 11. This is what's going on in Sister White as she wrote chapter 11, working for the intemperate. Whiskey was dirt cheap, and the, and the rich and the, and the famous, their, their choice of drug was opium powder. And of course, you know that uh, the, the rich and famous, you know that trickled down to the masses. So what's new? So what's new since uh, the, the servant of the Lord, the prophet of God, wrote... Uh, 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 that book that was published in 1909. So what's new? Two weeks ago, uh, President Biden, uh, in the State of the Union, he reminded us that, that there's not much new. He said, since I was in the Obama administration, I was sponsoring bills to Congress uh, with billions of dollars for the opioid epidemic. So, so what's new? Nothing is new except we have to be on the front line for those people who are struggling and hurting. And, and it's it's, I know that it's, uh, uh, it's not for everybody. But it is, uh, uh, there is a great need. And what we're doing, uh, Jesus, is at, Jesus is at Peter's house. Jesus is at Peter's house. And the Bible says that, he's, that he healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law. And as the evening came along, uh, the Bible says that he's bringing uh, a people uh, uh, all sorts of people over to him and he's healing them from their evil spirits that are within him. And you know how he's healing them? He's healing them with his word. And so when he sent the 70 out 
the 70 uh, 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 disciples out, they were healing people with their word. But God has given us uh, the, the advantages of, uh, uh, of uh, Christian uh, recovery programs where we come together and we work on our, our, uh, our struggles. And whatever we're struggling with, don't let it be your faith in God. So, for, for nearly 10 years, I've experienced weariness from time to time, but it always seemed, it always seemed that some person or some situation would reignite my passion for this ministry over the past 10 years, nine and a half years. One of, the better, one of my better analogies for Celebrate Recovery is, is that it is a way station connected to the church. You guys remember um, uh, Luke chapter 10, the, the Good Samaritan, right? A, a, it's a room at the end where Good Samaritans receive those whose pain has become greater, has become greater than their pride and their in their denial. Where our liturgy is uniquely Christian recovery, where the Good Samaritans themselves have been through the crucible of, of, of uh, step studies. God wants us to uh, exfoliate or, or to deteriorate this hardcore exterior uh, from those in pain and in denial, including we who are the Good Samaritans, in order to, uh, in order to have uh, uh, first-hand empathy in ministry for the intemperate. And quite frankly, beloved, this could be a line drawn in the sand for many of us. Ce uh, ministry and celebrate, uh, uh, this kind of ministry is not for everybody, but that's okay. We're talking about ministry in general. All ministry in God's church, it, uh, we apply our passion and compassion in ministry. All ministry. So it's not for everybody. We get it. We're not here to judge. We're just, ta we're just talking about the principles of accountability to God and to an another person. So long as our name is a Valley Crossroads SDA church is on that Celebrate Recovery website, we are accountable to this community. That's the bottom line. So that's why I'm sharing with you today. We have to make a decision. And so what do I do? I go to my church family. And we pray about it, and we ask God for direction. So, as a part of our message today, we are we want to do some show and tell. We want to uh, to uh, uh, we thought it would be interesting to share just a sample of what CR leadership looks like, uh, to get a rare look at what they look like and what they're talking about. So, uh, just so. Uh, uh, this is a show and tell of our national leadership. Uh, is, it's about uh, a brief introduction of, uh, of their names and faces. So what I'm trying to show is on this uh, video that's coming up, what I'm trying to show is that in Celebrate Recovery, uh, when you're in leadership, you step before the mic, you step before the, the video camera, and you say, my name is Reggie. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's what you do. And this way, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, the, the, the taboo or whatever it is, is taken away. Because we are not defined by our struggles. 
We are the children of God. So let me share this with you for a minute. not going to happen? God's plan is that we get to experience his delight and his healing so that we can in turn show love and compassion to others. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with drugs and alcohol and food issues. My name is Rodney. You know, as a ministry leader, I, I don't know if you can relate to this, but I've been in those seasons where I feel like I'm just kind of full of, of just exhaustion, that place where I feel like I kind of get frozen. I, I know I'm a loving and kind person, but I, I get in those seasons where I start to believe that and, and think these thoughts that I, I love and care so much that it literally feels like it's killing me. You ever been there? This place where you just kind of get frozen and feel like, I don't think I have anything left in my tank. And, and maybe you even sway to the other side and, and you begin to develop this contempt for the people that God has called you to serve. Maybe you even start to doubt God's calling for you on your life. That's a bad place to be, isn't it? I want to spend the next little bit of time here with you today to talk about something that you may or may not be familiar with. It's something called compassion fatigue. And even hearing that word, it's like, what, what is that, right? It can sound a little bit wimpy, but, but make no mistake about it. It is one of the most lethal things that takes out so many men and women in ministry across the world and, and really has a huge ramifications on our heart and life. And so as we jump into this topic, I want to unpack a few terms that you may or may not be familiar with. And, and one of those is burnout. You know, this one can be kind of misused a lot, but it's typically used in the workplace. And, and this is that place where we start to just become irritable, right? We, we have this, this thing of, of I, I don't like my workplace. I get a little bit irritable, right? Have you ever been there? where we start to develop this, it kind of starts and it progresses this way, where we start out with this level of enthusiasm, and then we find ourselves slipping into a little bit of stagnation, and then this fatigue and frustration sets in, and eventually apathy. And it has very real effects on us, where we start to experience physical and, men and mental and, and uh, emotional effects on our life that can be so damaging to our life. And so God takes this, this compassion fatigue and reveals it to us and, and creates these signals. And so this compassion fatigue, which weaves in with, with burnout, has been referred to as the cost of caring. Wow, that's a pretty compelling uh, definition. Listen to what Francois Mathau says about compassion fatigue. She says this. Compassion fatigue is the gradual erosion of all things that keep us connected to others in our caregiver role, our empathy, our hope, and of course our compassion, not only for others, but also for ourselves. See, we, we pour out and we give and give and give and, and, and we see this erosion happening in our own heart and soul. Or something that we can develop in this is called this the secondary traumatic stress. And this is when we hear uh, over and over really hard things. You'll see this with first responders where they see and hear traumatic things. And they can develop these, these PTSD symptoms, right? Or for us, it can be something called vicarious trauma where I sit with you in your pain and you tell me really hard things. And in the same way, I take on some of those those PTSD symptoms that can be so damaging, right? 
And if these are left unaddressed, it literally changes our whole lens of how I see God and others and even the world. And so it's so important that we address it. But it doesn't just happen with professionals. It happens with pastors and ministry leaders and step study leaders and open share leaders and, 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 and sponsors and accountability partners. If we don't address it, it will own us and will literally take us out of ministry. And so how do we move out of this, this fatigue state and, and really helping God to sustain this God-given calling that he has given us? Well, I have to start by asking this question, and it sounds like a no-brainer when you hear me say it, but, but it's so instrumental to my health. I have to ask, am I allowing my heart and my mind to rest? You see, if we don't rest, we don't replenish, and it begins to consume us. And God gave us a beautiful example of what it means to, to rest and, and to replenish, right? When he created and breathed life into creation, right? And so we start with seeing this example. For six days, God breathed life into creation, right? And then what did he do on the seventh day? He breathed in and he rested. And what a great example for us that we can follow God's example that he says, if you'll do this, you'll, you'll be replenished. You'll be able to receive the blessings that you'll be able to walk in this, in this new life that I have given you in service as we live out principle eight. And so there's some things that, that we do. Uh, there's some, as I was digging into this, I learned some things about when we don't rest, when we work solid without rest, there's some things that can happen to us, right? We can develop insomnia, right? Or, or sleepiness, or, or we begin to experience uh, hormonal imbalances or, or fatigue, irritability, and even organ stress. Isn't that fascinating? Some very serious physical and spiritual symptoms from us not taking time to rest. And here's the sad reality. Do you know that about a fourth of Protestant Christians actually apply this thing that is called the Sabbath and rest to their life? Only a fourth of Christians. That means, and the, and the culture drives us to do that, doesn't it? You got to keep going. There's something more that needs to be done. And God says, that's not what I designed you to do. In fact, it's actually killing you. I love A.J. Swoboda uh, actually says this, that perhaps obeying God is not your motivating factor for some, but living longer definitely is, right? So when we don't take care of our heart and our soul, rest our mind and our heart, red flags pop up. And the very first one that's an indicator for us is when we have this uh, feeling of feeling less compassionate. I stop. I think there's one more church about, um, about uh, I wanted to share this one about amends because um, uh, some of the churches uh, that we, uh, some of the churches, our church is going through it. So I wanted to, to share with you uh, what Celebrate Recovery talks about amends. Uh, uh, by the way, I've been meaning to get with uh, uh, Brother Rodney, I'm interested to know uh, what 4% he was talking about. I think he might be on to something. Um, if you can't get it, that's okay. Hey everyone, I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, overcoming food issues and control, and seeking healing from racial trauma. My name is Cheryl, and I'm the Director of Cultural Communities. Today I'm going to talk about how to make amends with a person who is no longer with us, who's unavailable, or simply unsafe to be around. Step 8 says this, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6, 31. Principle 6 says this. Evaluate all my relationships. Offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me and make amends for harm I've done to others. Except when to do so 
would harm them or others. Happy are the merciful, Matthew 5, 7. Happy are the peacemakers, Matthew 5, 9. Making amends and offering forgiveness is an important aspect of the recovery and God's peacemaking process. Mm -hmm. In previous lessons, we've done some hard work. We've come out of denial, admitted that there's a problem. We've turned our heart over to the care of Christ. We've accepted the fact that he can do for us what he, what he can do for us, something that we've never been able to do for ourselves. And we've accepted the great exchange, his life, for our sins and the ability to experience healing and freedom. We journeyed through principle four, where we made lists of people and events and wrote down the good and the heavy things that we'd walk through in our lives. In principle five, we brought someone into the recovery, into the recovery process. And here we land on principle six. This is where we take action. Making amends takes us from the past and creates momentum towards our future. Making amends is like a bridge that takes us from the point of dealing with events that happened previously and points us towards our future. When we're stuck in the past, dealing with, facing, and holding on to the hurts, the resentments, or the wrongs others have caused us, it can be difficult to experience for forward momentum in our recovery, or if we've brought harm, or if we've hurt others and haven't apologized, asked for forgiveness, or made amends, if we haven't made it right, we become stuck, making it difficult to experience momentum or forward movement in our recovery. I just want to take a moment and say that forgiveness is a process. I heard Johnny Baker say this about step eight. He says, we became willing to make amends. I want to take a quick moment and focus on the word became. We became willing. Became is a coming to or a growing to, which indicates that it's a process. When we're doing the work, we come to this step. Sometimes it's hard to remember that this is a process and we've done a lot of work leading up to step eight. And sometimes the most important part of making amends is realizing that maybe you need to forgive yourself just as much as you need to ask someone else for forgiveness. Often, we beat ourselves up over small issues or transgressions, saying the wrong thing or potentially offending someone, not being grateful enough, and we hold on to unnecessary shame or regret. Instead, work on letting go of any negative feelings you've harbored towards yourself or the, or feeling wrong, or the wrongs that you've committed, and let's commit our feelings and our ways to the care of Christ. Amen. 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 How many of you already know that? Say amen. amen. You already know that. It, it's, it's, it's biblical principles and with, uh, uh, with uh, integrity to the, to the scriptures. And it's, uh, it, it's so important and we don't think about it because we're so prideful. And so it takes God's church to remind us and to help others to make amends because of their broken situation at home, in family life, married life, or whatever, or in the community, at work, or whatever. And so we continue to take personal inventory, and when we are wrong, we promptly admit it. But how many of us already knew that? Bell and Crossroads, we know that. And so someone might say, well, what's holding us up? When uh, 10 years ago, when we had our first step studies, it was maybe a month and a half. And by a month and a half, there was not a dry eye in the room. It was the men's step study. There wasn't a dry eye in the room. We were all, we were all pulling for one another, and it was like an upper room experience. Men's step study. 
And so, and so who went in there? There were clergy in there. There were uh, church officers. And there were even people in there we've never seen before was in that room. And some of you know, been here long enough, I went kicking and screaming to go to step studies or to, 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 to do celebrate recovery. Because my pride and my denial uh, was still greater than my pain. And so as long as our name is on that Celebrate Recovery website, I, if you ask me, I'll show you my Texas. And the, 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 the pain of not being able to say, yeah, come on, we're open. We're not open. So uh, the, the invitation uh, stands. We need about six or more volunteers to make an impact on our church and in our community. Now, if we say that the church doesn't need CR, we're in denial. If the church says that we do not need CR, we are in, in denial. So I want to close by saying that God, uh, that God has called us. You remember David, King David? King David, he prayed to God to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, wash his sins away, to, to wipe out his transgressions, and he asked God uh, to... Uh, uh, he didn't, want to, he didn't want to hide his sin anymore. He wanted his sin to be out in the open. He didn't want to hide it anymore. And so he knew that the only way that he could be uh, 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 in good stead with his heavenly father is, was to, uh, uh, to have a, 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 a sacrifice, the righteousness of God and the sacrifice of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And so, Valley Crossroads, we are one of the most uh, 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 spiritually intellectual churches in this area, and we know all of that. So, what do you think, as we think about, as I close, that, that we be the Good Samaritan? and that we bring people in and take care of the community so that, uh, uh, so that we can carry on the work of our Lord and Savior. His spirit, his ministry, his prophet, why not us? Thank you for letting me share.